for today. So I'd like to introduce the co-founder of FGL.com and Gamersafe. Chris Hughes uh, and his products have helped web and mobile developers make millions annually. So here to tell us about tips for indie and web game developers moving to mobile is Chris Hughes. Thank you. So I don't know if I can put this. There we go. Can you hear me? So uh, apologize for the packed house here, but uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. So welcome to Tips for the Indie Web Game Developer Moving to Mobile. Um, I'm Chris Hughes. I'm the co-founder of FGL. A little background on FGL that I think is relevant to how we got the data for this. Uh, we work with over 30,000 independent developer, uh, game developers. We help them to get their games published and sponsored and licensed. Uh, we also uh, help them to get their games distributed to mobile and to web. Uh, I want to explain a little bit about how I set this up, this presentation. I thought about things, uh, talks that I've gone to and what I got out of them. And what I find helpful is to have a list of takeaways at the end that I can refer to and go back to. Uh, so what I did is I set up basically each slide to have one or more takeaways. This slide's no different. Uh, it has a takeaway, which is Chris Hughes is awesome. <laughs> That's one you're going to want to write down, highlight, put doodled hearts around it. Uh, so welcome to the indie era. Right now, as an indie game developer, you can reach as far as you want. You can have the number one app in any uh, mobile marketplace. You can have hundreds of millions of views in your game. There are companies who are focused on indie developers. There are bundles and sales and consoles and marketing strategies. They're all dedicated to indie games and indie developers. Uh, if you look at what's popular now out there with games, you'll see that a lot of them can be or are made by small teams or individuals. And I think what's funny about that is actually if you look about five years ago or more, if you weren't working for one of these really large uh, game development companies, you really were irrelevant. But right now what you're seeing is that a lot of those people working for those companies are falling off, starting their own indie companies or joining indie companies. So it's really cool to be indie right now. With that said, we gotta worry about not letting it slip away. Uh, the market's changing, the audience is moving. If we don't, as indie developers, kind of move into that new land, it's gonna be occupied by someone else and most likely it's gonna be a large company. So I wanna real quick uh, state that it's obvious that these lines are a little bit blurred from web or mobile. Uh, obviously, you can play a web game through your browser and your mobile device, things like that. Uh, but just to make it uh, easy on us for this, what I want to say is that uh, you know, I want to define web as a game that you're playing on your computer with the you know, control scheme of like a keyboard and a mouse, and mobile to be a touchscreen device, a tablet, or a smartphone, just to make it easy on us. So another a question that comes up when, when you say we're moving uh, to mobile is are we moving away from the web? And I want to make the argument that we're not moving away from the web. We're just moving into a new space. So web is still important. And I'm going to make some, uh, some statements here that kind of show why web and mobile are important. So right now, uh, in web, there are still a lot of people and money. A recent estimate uh, by a, a firm that did an analysis of the industry showed that there's $6.7 billion in the web game industry this year. So that's a huge chunk of money. That's not something you should just like walk away from and leave. You know, someone's going to pick that up. So that's something that we should probably still stay and, and try to uh, keep some of that. Also on FGL, what we see is that uh, games that we sell for web licenses are selling for more than ever before. So there's no downward trend that we can see even on the games that we work with. But of course, we know that mobile is huge. This is a really cool chart. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to go through all of it in depth, but I want to I want to point out the green bars, so the dark green and the light green bars, what they represent are the market share of tablets and smartphones in the overall game market. So the, the bars that are going up are the overall game market, the green bars are the, the mobile section of that. Uh, what we see is that the, uh, the, the market share is increasing, but what's more interesting is that the overall market's increasing, so they're a bigger chunk of a bigger pie. So we really can't ignore the significance of mobile is it, something that we definitely need to be on top of, especially when you look at the other markets are stagnating or even shrinking. Um, so uh, some more examples about mobile from our <coughs> perspective at FGL are games that list for uh, both mobile and web licenses are selling for four times more right now than games that are just list listing mobile licenses. So uh, a little background on that. So if on FGL you upload your game, we have publishers that come through and they, then they place bids on buying licenses or, or publishing rights. And so what we're seeing is, is developers are saying, hey, here's just my web game. They're, they're losing out on a lot of money from the developers. They're saying, okay, here's the mobile and web rights to the game. 
And what's really interesting to me is that these games sometimes aren't even made for mobile yet. They're just saying, hey, you have the rights to it. Uh, so that's kind of a really cool thing. And also when we talk to our publishers, we see that they all are focusing both on web and mobile, not just one or the other. So some other reasons, cross-promotion. This is a really cool one. Even a year or so ago, this was a, kind of an insignificant factor, but what we're seeing is that by using a web game to promote a mobile game is becoming a better conversion. So, you, so players on the web, if you tell them about your mobile game or somehow lead them to your mobile game, they're actually installing that or buying that game. Uh, also, and this one I think is huge and, and really underused is, it's really a lot easier to get exposure on the web if you have a decent game. If you, if you put your game on a couple of the major portals even, you're very likely to get millions of plays. And you can use this data to make your mobile game better. And it's a lot harder to get the exposure on the mobile side. So I think by leveraging the amount of traffic and the learning that you can get from player responses and from the data that you collect on the web, you can make your mobile game a lot better and use that to make it more polished and, and a better chance to get exposure there. And also there's not a lot of reasons why not. I'll cover that uh, in the next slide. So when, uh, and this is maybe more specifically about moving from web to mobile. Uh, if you have a background in, in web game design, there's some design things to keep in mind, and these might be obvious, but they're definitely worth noting. Uh, the, so the, the, the interface on in which you use your game needs to be really thought about. So if you have mouse only, actually it's probably pretty easy to transition to a touch screen. However, if you're using the keyboard, you're gonna have to get you know, thoughtful and, and, uh, and innovative about how that's gonna work on a, on a touch screen mobile device. Another one that I, this is actually a big one that I see a lot of developers stumble over is the resolution or scale of the game. So on the web, you know, you have a monitor and as long as you're within that bounds of some sort, you're usually okay. You move to mobile and you see that there's, I mean, hundreds of different resolutions, hundreds of different screen sizes. So it's something that you really need to make sure that you're thinking of when designing your game that it's gonna work uh, well on both. And then the user interface is a big deal. So is the button easy to press or the, uh, is the text easy to read? This is stuff that you need to make sure that you're thinking about. And I would argue that these things actually make your web game better anyway because these are things that make the game easier. Also the business model is a big deal. Um, the, the kind of analogy that I always use or the metaphor for developers is, you know, when you design your game, it's like, it's like baking a cake. And so one of the ingredients in baking that cake is your business model. You need to make sure it's kind of baked into it. You can't just slap it on afterward, especially when thinking about both markets of web and mobile because they're different. And sometimes you might want to monetize web differently than you monetize mobile. Uh, and there's no right answer. That's just something that you have to think about depending on your game and what you're trying to accomplish. With this next point, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot. This could easily be misinterpreted, misconstrued. Uh, but especially with indie developers, what I've seen is that a lot of them jump to in-game purchases as like their savior, you know, their way to make a million dollars easily. And it's just not the way it works. You have to be very thoughtful about how you implement something like that. Um, and in fact, I would probably recommend that if, if you're moving to mobile to first try out uh, you know, models that you're more comfortable with. So I have this idea of going through some tools to help uh, developers that are moving to maybe you know, ways to build such that you can compile both to web and mobile or maybe move your current web game to mobile. But as I started looking into it, I found out that there's quite a few tools out there and uh, in fact, they fill up this entire slide uh, with just the ones I could find, even at such a small amount. So basically, I, the point is here is it's not really an excuse anymore to use technology as the crutch to why you're not on both. Um, there's, there's, there's many solutions, as you see here, there's more. In fact, FGL even has a way to port games to mobile. Uh, so it's, it's, it seems like everyone's making this and, and it shouldn't be a, an excuse. Um, publishers, this is one that with uh, indie developers is actually kind of hard too because uh, I get kind of polar responses. They're either always asking me like, help me find a publisher, I need a publisher, or they're asking me why they need a publisher. Why do I need a publisher? I can just submit myself to any marketplace. I don't, I don't need their help. But I want to kind of try to convince you that publishers are your friends. Well, most of them are your friends. So, uh, in this, and this is I think why publishers have the bad rap that they have, is there's this kind of traditional old school publisher. They were the ones who were around kind of when all this was, with the mobile craze, uh, game craze especially was starting. Um, they have a very narrow view of things. They, uh, they really want, they, what they say when I talk to them a lot of times is I want AAA content. And what's funny is that they're defining what AAA is and, and I can tell you that it's, it's less to do with the game and more to do with how it, it generates revenue. Uh, they want this kind of 
goose that lays the golden eggs. Um, they're also, they're, they're not worried about the games innovating beyond the business layer. They want to make sure that the games are making more money. How can we improve that? How can we improve things like that? Uh, and the big ones to me is are afraid to risk money, which is, is kind of counterintuitive to the rest of this. W when I talk to, to these publishers, I call the old school publishers, they, they say, hey, we've got this rev share deal. We have this great platform. They're, you know, developers can make you know, tons of money. There's no reason that we need to put anything up front. Um, but uh, it, the reality is that uh, what I always tell developers is if someone comes to you with a rev share deal and they're not willing to put anything up front, basically what they're saying is they don't value your game and they don't value their platform. Because if they did, they, they would be willing to put money up front to make more money. The good news is that there are a new wave of publishers who are coming in who have a different view of things. They're, they're much broader view. They want a mix of games. They want, they want games that they don't mind if they're smaller, shorter, if they're innovative, if they're fun. They want to build their brand. They want to make sure that players really associate their company with great and fun games. Now, they still want AAA games. It's just part of the mobile ecosystem. Uh, and in fact, it's kind of fueling the, the mobile ecosystem. But what they do is they, they're really smart about how they use these games to, to retain users and to push users to those games. Uh, and on that note, they, they, on the innovation, they really want to make sure that these games are innovating on all levels. And they're willing to put money up front. This is really great. Uh, we actually see this through FGL, uh, I mean, quite significant amounts of money that they're putting up front to be able to get the license to these games and be associated with them. Uh, and, and as I said, they, they usually want both the web and mobile rights. They kind of want a really broad uh, user base. They want to make sure that they're relevant, not just on mobile devices. So uh, these are just some miscellaneous tips that we've learned through our platforms that I think are really helpful. Uh, game rating, and what I mean by game rating here is if you go to an app store and you look at like the star rating, uh, it may be obvious, but the better the rating, the more likely someone is to download, install, or buy your app. So what we found is that most ratings on, on mobile games go towards technical ratings. So the game crashed, the game didn't load. It's funny, we even had situations where we marked it on Android as, oh, don't play on these devices because it doesn't play, and they rate us down because they can't play it on those devices. So, so we get a lot of ratings for this, and, and as the rating goes down, your, your game is less likely to get installed so what we've, what we've tried experimenting with, uh, we have a thousand games that we're able to do this with. We, we started putting somewhere during the gameplay uh, a page to come up to say, hey, you know, please rate our game. And what this did is it significantly increased the rating on the game. Uh, I think the way that we did it is on uh, ads that, or uh, games that were ad funded, on every 10th ad we showed basically a takeover that said, hey, please rate our game. And that was great because basically by the 10th playthrough, you're, you're involved in the game, you like it, so you're gonna rate it something good. So uh, I'm gonna go through some charts here that show why you really should be doing cross promotion, whether it's with your games or someone else's games in your games. So this is an example of games that we did some early cross promotion for, but then we uh, ramped it down. And as you can see, uh, we have uh, a significant change in where this went from um, when they were being cross promoted to when they uh, stopped, it. well we, we never actually stopped it, but when we minimized the cross promotion. Uh, and just to explain this chart a little bit, is that this is a, a particular revenue, daily revenue of a game. So this is a premium game sold for 99 cents. And uh, you can see the, the drop down of it as the cross promotion drop down. And so this will be a chart showing a game that sim was similar, but did ongoing cross promotion throughout, we never stopped. And as you can see, uh, the revenue was pretty uh, significant all the way through, and in fact had spikes when new games would come out to cross promote it. Another cool thing that if you're moving from uh, web to mobile and you don't have a lot of experiences, there's some cool things you can fiddle with. If you have a premium game, uh, such as this one was, you can actually you know, mess with the, the pricing of the game to, to see what you get. In this particular case, we had a game that was selling for $2. It was doing okay, it started to, to ramp down. Uh, so the developer decided to change it to a dollar. What they found is they did not increase installs at all, but they lost half the revenue. So then what they did is said, hey, I wonder if I increase it to $3, what will happen? So he did that, and what happened is the number of installs did not change at all, yet he tripled his, his revenue. Just because uh, basically at this point in the game's life cycle, people who were coming to the game were wanting to buy the game. So $3 was fair to them. And who knows what the price might be. There might be a higher number he could try. So um, looking forward, kind of like I, I said at the beginning that really web and mobile, the, the line's blurred and I think that's gonna increase. 
but the good thing is, is that if we focus on both, so we make sure that we're, we're focusing on both the web and looking at the future of mobile, uh, I really think that uh, we'll be ahead of the game and we'll be uh, there for any markets that, that happen to come up or as things change. So if there's any questions, you can take those. I think there's a mic. No questions? I was perfect. Nice. Anything? There's a mic, I guess. Sorry, it's coming. Thanks. Um, so I've used FGL, and I, I just had a question about how to get more impact, like how to get discovered and, and get more bids on, on, on your titles that you put up there. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have any tips that you could share. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, pertinent to this talk, obviously, uh, what we've seen is that if you offer the mobile license to the game, there's a significant increase in number of bids and amount of bids. Just in general, uh, a, a big thing is, um, well, you can let us know and we can make sure if it's fallen through the cracks. But there's, there's obviously different things you can do, like we have you know, Last Call and Buy It Now, and there's all type, types of filtering mechanics you can take advantage of to get you know, more views in your game. And you have specific questions you can ask me after, too, because some, you know, some games are different. I noticed that uh, a few years back, Flash Gaming was uh, the, the the only available option in FGL. So is is typical uh, Unity 3D engine game, um, do they make more money, or is Flash still number one, or how is it? Yeah, so for, for web, Flash still is, is the dominant technology. Um, we really did a big push for Unity. Uh, we've tried HTML5. There's some minor uptake on those. The, obviously, the, the, the benefits those have over Flash right now, Flash has air, but Unity is much better on mobile, uh, at least right now, performance-wise. And HTML5 is still just, I think, getting started. I mean, I think the hype started too early there. Uh, so right now, yeah, I mean, really, the, the for if you were wanting to focus on web, Flash is the best way to do it. The good thing is air is, depending on the type of game, is a good option. And as I said, actually, FGL has a, a source now that where we can port any, any, if you have a Swift, we can actually port that to hundreds of mobile platforms for you. So that's a viable option. Right, no <laughs> and just Thanks. join me in. Team Chris. Thank you.